Good morning, dear friends. Today we are in the judgment of Keshan and Bharti. So we'll start with reading of Justice Sikri's judgment. And Justice Sikri's judgment runs into almost 101 pages in the 477 paragraphs. Uh, so essential is the crux of the matter. Like the constitutional issues, you will find it from the last 100 paragraphs from 387 to 477, 90 paragraphs or something. But the major uh, reasoning is the build-up, how he builds up in writing his judgment and reaching the conclusion. So the major part of the narration would be, what is the importance of preamble? The bottom line of the preamble would be that it would be taken as a preamble, which is a higher preamble, it's a preamble of the constitution and not some legislation that would be done. Secondly, the question would be whether legislature can delegate its power, like it can abdicate itself and substitute itself to the new legislature. That would be one of the issues. Then there would be an issue as to whether there is an implied limitations. So the question and concept of implied limitations, there's a huge discussion which comes in because the implied limitations would actually result in the reasoning whether constitution, if empowered to amend the constitution, would do away with the constitution and do something very drastic, like to say that the basic structure doctrine, okay, whether the constitution can rubbish, whether the constitutional amendment Okay, were sorted by parliament could rubbish the entire constitution and bring about a new constitution. Okay, so how Justice Sikri actually builds up his narration, that would is that's very interesting. He divides his judgment into eight parts. Okay, the first part being introduction. Para two gives you all the details that there is a constitutional challenge thrown. It's a challenge in the Article Thirty Two petitions and how they have made it. Then the passing of certain legislations, being one of these legislations, okay, by 24th Amendment, and so on and so forth. Then in para 8, he says, when the case was placed before the constitutional bench, you know, remember any constitutional issue will have to be heard by a bench, okay, a constitutional bench, it was referred to a larger bench. The larger bench was accordingly constituted. It was then felt that it would be necessary to decide whether IC Golaknath versus State of Punjab has been rightly decided. Now, Golaknath's case is the case which actually introduces the concept of prospective overruling. Okay. Uh, then they say that what is the extent of the amending power conferred by Article 316 apart from Article 13 sub clause 4 of the Parliament? Now, one thing we'll have to remember is that 13 sub clause 2 by this particular time when Keshanan Bharti was being decided, had been amended. It had been amended to an extent that there was a clause which says that nothing in Article 368 would be equated as a law under Article 30. So, under that change circumstances, this reference is being decided by a larger bench. Then the argument was. Uh, respondents claim that parliament can abrogate fundamental rights. As such, freedom of speech, expression, freedom of association, etc. They claim that democracy can never be replaced and one party will establish. Indeed, short of repeal of constitution, any form of government with no freedom to the citizens can be set up by parliament by exercising its power under Article 360. So, except for replacing democracy, everything else can be done. For the petitioner sides, it was said that the parliament's power is limited. Petitioner says the constitution of India has given citizens freedoms, which were to subsist forever. And the constitution was drafted to free the nation from any future tyranny. Now, what mark the words? The words are any future tyranny of the referendum project. It is this freedom from tyranny, which according to the petitioners, had been taken away by the impugn article 31c which has been instituted by 25th Amendment. If Article 31c is valid, they say, year after the Parliament and the State Legislature, act 
not the constitution will determine how much freedom is good for the citizens. So 31C is the culprit actually. 31C, even the state legislatures were empowered to amend the constitution. Now, that actually would be the bone of contention. And let's see how Justice Sikhi deals with it when it comes up. These cases raise grave issues. But however grave the issue, the answer must depend on the interpretation of the article 368. So 368 is what it comes. Then there's a secret moves to interpretation of Gola class. He says, before proceeding with the main task, it is necessary to ask what was decided in IC Gola class versus State of Punjab. In order to properly appreciate that case, it is necessary first to have the look at Sheikh Shankari Prasad versus Union of India and State of Bihar and Sajjan Singh's case. So he resorts to Shankari Prasad and Sajjan Singh's case as to what was decided in those two cases. Para 18 says, the fact that the said article refers to the two houses of the parliament and the president's appointee and not the parliament does not lead to the inference that the body which is invested with the power to amend is not the parliament but a different body consisting of two houses. Now, here there is a small catch. Article 379 was in play in the, during the first amendment because 379 was like so there was a concept of provincial parliament at that point of time. Okay. Now that concept does not survive. So what was said was that if there is an amendment, then there's an amendment. That body not by the provincial amendment. I may mention that Mr. Sivai contends that the conclusion just mentioned was wrong. And the body that amends the constitution article 368 is not parliament. The view that Article 316 was a complete code then that was resorted, the law was equated. In the context of Article 13, law must be taken to mean as use or regulations made in certain exercise of ordinary legislative powers, not amendment. So th this actually is the build up to the debate whether 13 sub clause 2 law and 368 amendment law are both equal. Now the rundown would be some. Till a particular point, it was said that they are equal. Then it was said they are not unequal with the prospect to over elect. And now the Supreme Court in Keshan and Bharti would ultimately reach to a stage where it would say that, look, equal, unequal, you can't change the constitution. You can't abrogate and repeal the entire constitution. It has to change the basic structure of it. <clears throat> the Although the decision of Shankari Prasad's case was not challenged in Sajjan Singh's case, Gajendra Gadkari, the Chief Justice, thought it fit to give reasons for expressing full concurrence with that decision. The only, uh, so what actually Shankari Prasad has held is, in the context of Article 13, law must be taken to mean rules and regulations made in the exercise of ordinary legislative powers and not amendment to constitutions made in the exercise of constituent powers, with the result that 13 sub clause 2 does not affect amendment made under Article 368. Okay, the 13 sub clause 2 is not applicable to 368 because 1, 13 sub clause 2 is legislative functions, whereas 368 exercise is a constituent power exercise. Okay. So the Justice Gajendra Gadkar concurs with it in Sajjan Singh's case. The only contention before the court, in that particular case, 2 to 6 was to be amended. An amendment of 2 to 6 would have affected fundamentally. So the court jumped in and uh, said, the Chief Justice thought that the power to amend in the context was very wide power and it could not be controlled by a literary dictionary meaning of the word amend. He expressed his agreement with the reasoning of Patanjali Shastri regarding the applicability of Article 13 sub clause 2 of the Constitution Amendment Act. He further held that Article 368 confers on Parliament the right to amend the Constitution. It can be exercised overall by the provisions of the Constitution. He thought that if the Constitution makers had intended that any future amendment of the provisions in regard to the fundamental rights should be subject to Article 13 sub clause 2, they would have taken the precaution of making a clear provision in that behalf. Then he also agrees with A.K. Gopalan. He says, the inclusion of 13 sub clause 1 and 2, now this is A.K. Gopalan, 
in the constitution appears to be a matter of abundant caution even in the absence if any fundamental rights was infringed by a legislative enactment the court has always power to declare the enactment to the extent it transgresses the limit exactly so ek gopalan's case was approved just as kania in that case has held that irrespective of 13 sub clause 1 and 2 any erosion of fundamental rights courts should always step in and declare the enactment void if it violates fundamental rights that's included only by way of abundant precaution he was of the view that the relevant provisions of part 3 can be justly described as the foundation and cornerstone of the democratic way of life unheard in this country by the constitution ushered in this country by the constitution it cannot be said that fundamental rights guaranteed to our citizens are eternal and inviolate in the sense that they can never be abridged or amended according to him it was legitimate to assume that the constitution makers visualized that parliament should be competent to make amendments in these rights so as to meet the challenge of problems which may arise so law being a very limited concept it keeps on evolving okay so the parliament was empowered hidayatullah chief hidayatullah jaya has he was then agreed with the chief justice the 17th amendment was valid even though the procedure laid down in the proviso of 368 has not been followed but he expressed his difficulty in accepting the part of reasoning in shankari prasad case he observes as follows it is true that there is no complete definition of the word law but it is significant that the definition does not seek to exclude constitutional amendment so whereas justice gajendra galka say that 13 and 1 and 2 okay exclude justice hidayatullah would say that there is no indication that they are excluded this excluded excluded there is no indication which it would have been easy to indicate in the definition by adding but shall not include an amendment to the constitution so this is an amendment which actually came the drop Yes, sir. That is all. Further observe, the meaning of Article Thirteen has depends on the sense, and with the word "law" in Article Thirteen, sub clause two, is to be understood. If an amendment can be said to fall within the term of law, the fundamental rights becomes eternal and inviolate. This is the language of Japanese Constitution that he borrows. Article Thirteen is then on par with Article Five of American Federal Constitution. and it is inimitable prohibition as long as it stands according to justice adalat la preamble is more akin in nature to the american declaration of independence so our preamble is akin to the declaration of independence than to the preamble of or to the constitution of the united states it does not make any grant of power but it gives a direction and purpose to the constitution which is reflected in part 3 and part 4 fundamental right and political principle it is to be imagined that a third majority of the house is it to be imagined that a two third majority of the house at any time is all that is necessary to alter it without even consulting the states it is not even included in the proviso to article 368 and it is difficult to think that as it has not the protection of the proviso it must be within the main part of the article 368 in further observes i would require stronger reasons than those given in shankari prasad's case to make me accept the view that fundamental rights were not really fundamental but were intended to be given within the powers of amendment in common and in other parts of the constitution and without the concurrence of state what well, article 368 does is to lay down the manner of amendment and the necessary conditions for the effectiveness of the amendment the constitution gives so many assurances in part 3 that it would be difficult to think that they were the playthings of special majority so the assurance given by the constitution so the assurance given by the constitution of fundamental rights cannot be equated as a plaything
of a special majority. To hold this would mean that prima facie that the most solemn parts of our constitution stands on the same footing as any other provisions, and even on a less firm ground than on than one on which the articles mentioned in the proviso stands. Now here we find that Justice Sudhaj Tuma actually refuses to accept the concept. Firstly, he says he has got stronger reason. The fundamental rights are not really fundamental, and they are equal. To the constitution, so he actually introduces a theory that amongst our constitution there are few concepts which are very vital, and there are few which are vital, but in in a pedigree they would be less vital. So some are very significant, some are less significant, and this actually is the origin of the basic structure doctrine. It would be followed by other judges also, but it is just to say in Kishan and Bharti's case. Justice Sikri refers to what Justice Sudhayatullah says in Shankar Prasad case. Okay. Ah, yeah. This is then Justice Mudalkar would come. Now Justice Mudalkar would also come with the concept of basic structure. And he also agrees with it. He says 368 is plain enough to show that the action of Parliament in amending the Constitution as a legislative act like one in the exercise to normal legislative powers. The only difference in respect to amendment is the bill amending the constitution has to be passed by a special majority. The result of legislative action of legislature cannot be other than law. So if legislature is legislating, the outcome would be law. Therefore, it seems to me that the fact that the legislation deals with the amendment of provisions of constitution would not make it Result anything less than a law. So you can't say that I have done a legislative action, but it's not law. It is true that the constitution does not directly prohibit the amendment of part three. But it would indeed be strange that rights which are considered as fundamental and which include one which is guaranteed by the constitution by Article 32 should be more easily capable of being abridged or restricted than any of the matters referred to in the proviso of Article 360, some of which are perhaps less vital than fundamental rights. It is possible, as suggested by a learned brother, and an Article 360 merely lays down the procedure to be followed for amending the Constitution and does not confer a power to amend the Constitution, which I think has to be ascertained from the provisions sought to be amended, other relevant provisions of the PMR. Above all, a solemn dignified preamble, which appears to be the epitome of the basic features of the constitution, can it not be seen that there is that they, that these are indicia of the intention of the constituent assembly to give permanency to the basic features of the constitution? Now here you got the basic structure doctrine coming up for you. He says it is also a matter of consideration. Whether making a change in the basic feature of the constitution can be regarded merely as an amendment or would it be in effect rewriting part of the constitution and as the latter would it be within the purview of article 316. So whether constitution can be rewritten is what Justice Mudalkar is directly dealing with. Here, earlier you got the highlight of Justice Anandula. You say there are some things, okay, which are inviolable. You cannot take them. Japanese constitution and American constitution. He then stress the prime importance of PMO. The constitution indicates three modes of amendment. And assuming that the provisions of Article 368 confer a power on parliament to amend the constitution, it will have to be considered whether as long as the preamble stands unamended, the power can be exercised with respect to any of the basic features of constitutions. To illustrate my point, as long as the words sovereign, democratic, and republic are there, could the constitution be amended so as to depart from the democratic form of the government and its republic character? If that can be done, then as long as the word justice, social, economic, and political, etc. are there, could any of the rights enumerated in 14 to 19, 21, 25, 31, 32 be taken away? If they cannot, 
it will be for our consideration whether they can be modified. It has been said, no doubt, that the preamble is not part of our consideration. But I think that if upon a comparison of the preamble, with the broad features of the constitution, it would appear that the preamble is the epitome of those features. To put it differently, if these features are an amplification and consecration of the concept. So what Justice Mudalkar is doing is, he's saying that your preamble is actually the epitome of the features. It actually provides for amplification of the features which are to be provided in, in the constitution. It also gives you the conceptualization of all the concepts. Okay. It may have to be considered whether the preamble is not part of the constitution. While considering this question, it would be of relevance to bear in mind that the preamble is not of common law. Now, this is a preamble of constitution of India. It's not a preamble to any ordinary statute, which is maybe a delegated statute or a legislative piece. It's, it's a preamble of constitution of India and therefore it's not of common run. Okay. It is the stamp of deep deliberation and is marked with precision. Now we'll mark these words. It has got a stamp of deep deliberation as well as it has got a mark of precision. Would this not suggest that the framework of constitution attached special significance to it? Coming now to Golaknath's case. Okay. Then he comes to Shankari Prasad's case. Then he comes to the reasoning with Justice Subhara. Oh, now no, this is the judgment. Okay, the main judgment of Justice Sipil. And Subhara, Chief Justice, okay, what is he held? The aforesaid discussions leads to the following results. Okay, now the last case is being decided. The power of the parliament to amend the constitution is derived from 245, 246, 248 of the constitution, and not from 368, therefore. No. Mark here that earlier there was a debate that 368 started with the title procedure for amendment. So there was no power, it was only a procedure. When Keshan and Bharti was being decided, the constitution had been altered and the word power had been included. So the source of power to amend the constitution and the procedure to amend the constitution are now included in Article 316. Amendment is law within the meaning of Article 30. Then uh, abridges the, the third one, the, the Constitution Amendment, the 17th Amendment, abridges the scope of fundamental right from the basis of earlier decision of this scope, they were held valid. So this was prospective overruling is introduced. But the application of the doctrine of prospective overruling as explained by us, earlier our decisions will have only prospective operation. Therefore, the said amendments will continue to be valid. We declare that the parliament will have no power from the date of this decision to amend any of the provisions of part three of the constitution as to take away or abridge the fundamental rights issued there. Now, it must be borne in mind that these conclusions were given in the light of the constitution as it stood then. When Article 13 sub clause 2 subsisted in constitution. It was then not necessary to decide the ambit of Article 368 in the respect of the powers of Parliament to amend Article 13 sub clause 2 or amend Article 368 itself. It is these points of view that are now to be decided. So, as I said, that the Golaknath was dealing with a different 368, Kishan and Bhati is dealing with a 368, but actually has power and procedure in the cap. Okay, and secondly, it also, uh, there's also a thing in sub clause 4 which says that the law made under 360 would not be included as part of the article. Then, this is Siddhar Pula's quotation Sakana referred by him. That fundamental rights are outside the amendatory process if the amendment seeks to abridge or take away any of the rights. So this actually, I believe, is the notion of basic structure. Although Justice Hidayatullah limits it only to the fundamental rights. Okay? He says the fundamental rights are going to be abridged or taken away 
then we cannot amend the constitution and back it. Shankar Prasad case and Sajjan Singh's case considered that the power of amendment over part 3 of the constitution on an erroneous view of Article 13 sub clause 1 is That the first, fourth, and seventeenth amendment being the part of constitution by acquiescence for the long term and for the long term cannot now be challenged and then they contain authority. Contain authority. Okay, so they, they were being condoned in a sense because they have stolen the test of the law, they have been upheld by the Supreme Court, rightly or wrongly. But this court, having now laid down the fundamental rights, cannot be abridged or taken up by the insight of amended the process in Article 368 and further the inroads into these rights as they exist today will be illegal and unconstitutional unless it complies with Part 3 in general and Article 13 sub clause 2. So, what Justice Ayatullah does is actually 13 sub clause 2 and Part 3 are given supremacy over 368. You cannot abridge or you cannot take away, you cannot create fundamental rights. Then once you Jay's refer, okay. Then the reasons are given and then he says council said that they could not give an exhaustive catalogs of the basic features. But sovereignty, the republican form of government, the federal structure, and the fundamental rights are some of the features. The 17th Amendment had not derogated from the sovereignty, the republican form of government, and the federal structure. But the question whether they can be touched by the amendment is not arrived for decision. For the purpose of these cases, it is sufficient to say that the fundamental rights are within the reach of amending power. For the purpose of these cases, it is sufficient to say that the fundamental rights are within the reach of amending power. Now, let's go to the question. What Justice Wanshu is also contemplating is that is there anything, anything which can be seen as basic structure? And he agrees and he says that look, all these four catalogs are, you have given. Okay, although you also agree that there cannot be a um, one of the words, they cannot be silos which are untouchable. That this is basic structure, you can't touch them. You have given these four or five concepts, however, none of these cases arise over here. So he says, he refuses to go into it. Rama Swamiji says, Okay, fundamental right does not lift the fundamental rights above the constitution itself. And the federal structure is not an essential part of the constitution. That's also it comes in his judgment. In brief, six judges held, now this is Golak Nath's case. In brief, six judges held that in view of Article 13 sub clause 2, fundamental rights could not be abridged or taken away. Five judges held that Article 13 sub clause 2 was inapplicable to amend the constitution. So let's stop over here. Okay, this is the first and second chapter. Okay, introduction and what was held in Golak now, reasons given by Justice Sipi. Remember two vital things. First and foremost, that the 368 as it were, existed while Golak Nath was being decided. Okay, and Keshan on Bharti 368 are completely different. Before in IIC Golak Nath's case, the courts or the uh, government had to grapple and say that look, power. Although the title of 368 was the procedure to amend the constitution, the power was also located over there. This was clarified you know, by law, subsequent law. Secondly, what Justice Hidayatullah had revised, that look, you know, Justice Gajendra Garkar okay, said that 13 sub clause 2 is not indicative that 368 will be included over there. So he upheld 13, 368. But Justice Siddhartullah said that he will need stronger reasons that it's not included. That the law, amendment law is not to be covered by the embargo of 13 sub clause 2. So he refuses over there and says that fundamental rights, if you want to borrow the language of Japanese constitution and American constitution, they are immutable, they are, they are inviolable. They cannot be violated. And he equates our preamble with the preamble of uh, declaration of independence. He doesn't equate it with the American. Yeah, constitution's preamble. He says no. Our preamble is akin to what 
is the American Declaration. And Justice Mudalkar and Justice Sudayatullah combinedly come up with the concept that there are few concepts, a few provisions of constitutions which are you know, immune. They can't be touched. They can't be changed. They are unalterable. Okay, so that's the basic thing that they have done. And uh, then we come to run down to other provisions. Okay, but formally speaking, that 13th sub clause 4, which says that 368 law is not a law under 13th sub clause 2, was absent when I.C. Golaknath was being decided. So, what pretty much I.C. Golaknath did was, it said that the constitution cannot touch a fundamental right. However, this would be prospective. It never has happened earlier. We have already condoned and acquiesced it, so we will keep on condoning. So, let's see in next lecture how interpretation of Article 368 is done by the SSC. We'll stop over here and let's see how, how we go.